I have a fun business. Um, Jeremy's in finance. Uh, we act, my company, Steelhead Productions, we build things. Um, so we're in the exposition and trade show business. You guys know what ex exhibitions are, expositions, trade fairs. Um, we do them domestically. We're based out of uh, beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I, like Jeremy, used to live in Seattle, but I moved to Las Vegas in 2010. Um, we've got 65 employees, and we really have two stories of our business. One was uh, before the Great Recession uh, in the United States of 2000, that lasted from about 2008 till 2010, and really had to reinvent our company since then. Um, and we've experienced a lot of tremendous growth. Um, what we do is we design and build these temporary branded environments uh, for these, these trade fairs. So uh, it's, real, it's a great business. Um, uh, no two projects are the same. We, we get to go through a design and a build process where we see our work take form right in front of us. Uh, so it's a really enjoyable business. It's got a lot of challenges like any other business. Um, that's super fun. Um, I've actually been involved with my business longer than my marriage as well. Um, in fact, it outlasted my marriage. So uh, I actually live in Las Vegas with my 16-year-old son. We like to wear the same hats. Um, so his name is Kyler. And so uh, basically a single dad running a, running a business, and it's uh, super fun. Uh, Jeremy asked me in August to come out and, and uh, and really do this experience along with them. It's been super, super cool so far. We spoke to some students in, in the city uh, last night, um, and I too am really grateful to be here. And uh, hopefully we can answer some questions of what it's really like. Oh, some of my contact information, some Instagram, uh, the company, and then, uh, and of course, if anybody wants to email me after with any questions, I'd be more than happy to respond to those. I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, leadership is, uh, you, you know, you don't want, you can't ultimately force people to follow you. I think that if, uh, first and foremost, it's about having some sort of vision um, and basically creating a destination, kind of an endpoint. Um, and then really, my, my role in, in my own company is really about aligning all of our employees toward that, en that endpoint. Uh, how we specifically get there, I think it's important for our team to have a lot of autonomy uh, so they, they can be creative in, in helping me navigate, um, but, but ultimately it's about setting kind of a target, a destination, uh, objectives, uh, and then uh, really resourcing the effort to get there. Uh, what would you say, Jeremy? You know, uh, when you go through school, you learn a lot about what to do in business. And really the job of a leader is to set the stage for how you're going to work as a business. It's not just what are we going to do, what are we going to deliver for customers, but how are we going to think about the way in which we deliver that and the things that are most important because you can't do everything. And if you try to do everything, then you will fail massively. And so really a leader's job is to pull people along with them. And to Sean's point, that requires vision. Uh, it requires bringing clarity for people to be able to go out and do the job and accomplish the outcome that the company's there to do. I often get the question, uh, it, can leadership be taught? And um, I think that it can be, I think you can set an example uh, and, and certainly create an effective model for leadership. Uh, but I think whether or not an individual has some of the inherent qualities of leadership within them, uh, I'm not sure that it's some, I think we can help coach it along, but I, I, I'm not sure that it's, you know, a skill set that if you don't have it, I think you can develop it, but, but I think it's important to have a good model to, to look for. Jeremy and I both have had multiple mentors and people that we've you know, really taken after. So it's important if you find that person to pay attention to what it is that they're doing that makes them effective. When I think of the word culture, I think of the how we work, um, what's important to us. So uh, we have had many people over the years that we have hired and brought into our business, and they've been really capable in terms of what they can do, how much work they can produce, and really destructive in terms of how they operate within the company because they didn't share our values about how we work and what's important to us, how we think about our customers, how we think about the product we deliver. Uh, so when I think about culture, it's about providing that environment. Every, every uh, entity has a culture. Your family has a culture. 
of how you treat each other, how you talk to each other, um, what your rituals are that you engage in, the holidays you celebrate, the way that you have dinner. Um, businesses are no different. It's all those sort of rules around how that operates. And as a business, you can either be intentional about that in terms of creating that system to support who you want to be, or you can just let it take on a life of its own. Um, and we found over the years that spending time being intentional about what that culture is that we want to create has been really helpful for getting a lot of people aligned and moving in the same direction. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the things that it's, um, people on a team want, want to have consistency out of their leadership. Uh, we are a value-based company at Steelhead, so we've got eight value sort of pillars that we base all of our decisions around. And uh, it's an it's a incredible tool for me uh, because uh, it helps to, to get real consistency out of my deci decision making. I think it helps the employees because they understand um, the way with which we work, some of our characteristics, and as Jeremy even said, some of our rituals and things like that. Um, so it's in the last, I would say, 15 to 20 years in Western business, culture really became a real buzzword um, and people were, you know, creating, you know, purposes and mission statements, so on and so forth. But I think that when it's really, really practiced and it's, and it's true and it's honest, there's a lot of companies and Jeremy and I can attest to this. We've seen companies think, well, I've, I've got to have value. So they'll write some words on a, on a, on a big placard and say those are our values but living your values is different than having them just written written on the board we use a thing at steelhead um, to grade uh, one another we are we do peer reviews uh, so our review process is not done by management it's it's done by other employees and we have a chart which is believer on one axis and achiever on the other axis and it's we're ultimately looking for high achievers and high believers a believer are people who continually push and advance the culture forward. Um, and then of course, achiever is how effective they are at their tasks and their jobs. So they're equally as important. One of the most common things I see, uh, and this is definitely, this is true in the US, is that there are a lot of people who when they think about getting into business, they think it's all about having the next big idea or the next big product. And so they look out there in the market and they see, what Instagram has done or what Facebook has done and they say I'm gonna go build that app or that thing that does something similar and almost inevitably those businesses fail because once you're copying what somebody else has done it's already too late um, what we've seen is the companies that are the most successful are the ones who get clear about who their customer is who's the person who is going to buy from me and why and they build their entire strategy around that um, and I know you can speak a lot to that because you guys use a value proposition model in terms of how they operate, which is building their entire business model and proposition around understanding your customer, what they value, what causes them pain, and then how to direct that into what products you're going to build. I mean, everybody here knows who Steve Jobs is, right? So there's a lot written about Steve Jobs that, that suggests that he's uh, responsible for inventing a lot of products that we didn't need or we didn't know we needed and whatnot. Um, have you guys seen that movie uh, that's called Steve Jobs? There's a scene in there at the end of the movie where he's on the parking lot, uh, the top of a parking garage with his daughter, and she's got a Walkman on. And as, she's gets, as she reaches for her car, he says, I'm going to put 500 songs in your pocket. And, and he goes, you know what, I'm going to put 1,000 songs in your pocket. And, uh, and he says something to the effect of, you carry around a brick that plays music and it's not acceptable or something like that. Well, I would really argue that he had, we was actually doing what Jeremy just suggested is he always had a customer in mind. Um, it was so innovative that it seemed like, well, what do we need an iPad or a tablet for? But I really think he had, a, he had an understanding that people love music, but they wanted portability. They wanted all of these things. And from that, the iPod was developed, you know, was developed. So, um, and we're, we're members of, a, of an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization, and it's a global organization, but we're members in, in stateside chapters, and it's amazing uh, to your question there, Josh, in terms of how many business owners just don't understand the fundamental differences between an objective, a strategy, and then tactics, in terms of what, what are the differences between those things. Um, 
So it, it, it's, it, it's amazing. I mean, I'm in a 10-member group, and there's, we'll, we'll engage in discussions all the time where um, it's, it becomes pretty clear that there is no strategy. We have a difficult time getting down to the objective. So it's something that we have to constantly, constantly practice. Um, does anybody know, do you guys know who Henry Ford is? So he's the guy who started the Ford Motor Company. He had a really famous quote, and he said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And obviously he was the guy who invented the mass-produced car. And so one of the common things that, that we have experienced over and over where we have struggled as a business is in solving the wrong problem. So if you think about a doctor, when someone comes into the doctor, they come into the doctor with symptoms. My nose is runny, I have a headache, my stomach hurts. And then the doctor tries to diagnose what may be the underlying illness that's there. In business, what happens, because you're always so busy with all the things that are happening that you're reacting to, is that it can become really easy to spend your time solving the symptoms and say, oh, you have a runny nose, let's solve that runny nose problem. Instead of taking a step back and saying, why is your nose runny? Is it because you're allergic to dogs? Is it because you have a cold? Is it because you just came down from Shembalak and your ears have been depressurized? I mean, whatever the reason is, if you understand what the core issue is, what the real problem is, and you go about solving that, then you'll solve the runny noses forever as opposed to solving the runny nose for now until one other thing changes and then it comes back again. I think that's something that Jeremy and I face on, the, on a daily basis is, is just that. Um, you know, if we're both the leaders of our organizations and kind of the doctors of, of the organization, we're faced a lot of times with employees or customers coming at us with problems. And uh, a lot of times those are symptomatic of something deeper. And if we just react to the problem, um, which sometimes is what people want, they want a quick answer. Um, and we have to be a little bit more patient and diligent in that diagnosis, which requires some patience. Yeah, so I, 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 I live by this concept of, um, well, this, this, this question kind of came up last night in terms of, uh, how much planning is too much planning? If you consider that, planning is based on a number of assumptions. So what happens when the first of your assumptions is off target? Do you scrap the rest of your plan, right? So where's the balance between a plan that is uh, you know, uh, flexible enough and has enough speed? So if you can imagine two ships, uh, old warships, right? Um, their main artillery or, or battle weapon was a cannon, and, but the cannonballs were a limited resource. So rather than just fire at a ship and be completely off target, what they would do is they would calibrate their distance with bullets. So this is a terminology we use often in my own company, which is called bullets, first bullets, then cannonballs. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get enough of the framework of the plan uh, kind of outlined and then start testing it really quickly. Um, and then Jeremy's got you know, some tech examples too, where this, this philosophy of, of rapid testing and then you get the feedback and then you make continuous adjustments. Um, we did an exercise last night with, some, with uh, some of the students where they had to deploy a strategy and build something. And it was very interesting to see some of the students w jumped right in and just started building things. Another, a couple of other groups committed a lot of time to paper and it was a plan on paper, and they were really in love with that plan on paper. But they were befuddled the moment their structure didn't stand up. They didn't allow enough time to change their tactics. Um, is anyone here a student in computer science or technology? No, not one. So has anyone read the book, The Lean Startup? So we got one. This is actually a big movement in the US, and it's this idea of saying rather than creating this big business model that would take 80 pages and years to produce, it's how can you spend the time to think about what you're trying to accomplish and then understand what are the one or two assumptions that are most important. If you really break down any financial model and you do sensitivity analysis on it, you'll find there are just a handful of assumptions typically that drive the results in that model. The idea behind the Lean Startup and the Lean methodology for technology development is to understand what those assumptions are and then to find the way to test them as quickly as you can with the smallest amount of resources. That way you can have a hypothesis, you can test it, and if it proves to be true, then you can invest more resources and more dollars into planning more and building things out. Um, and that's really a, a method in the US that we use a lot for rapid iteration. 
I also think that uh, depending on what the objective is and how many resources you have to achieve your objective, time is the almighty equalizer. Uh, you know, girl, boy, rich, poor, it doesn't matter where you come from. We all get 24 hours in a day. And so a lot of what the lean startup is about in that, in that methodology is, is, to, is you want to get things done quick. Uh, business in the United States and globally is super, super competitive. Um, so sometimes it's not about having the best idea, but it's having the idea first. And then you can get people in and then you can iterate on the idea. So speed's super, super important. And elongated, elongated planning is the, is, is the antithesis of, of speed. I've learned far more out of our failures than I have ever out of a successful idea. And it's funny because when you implement and you execute on an idea, success is expected, right? So we don't take a lot of time celebrating that success because what happened was exactly what was supposed to happen. However, when the, the strategy uh, fails, then you have to really take an inventory of, now what in the heck went wrong here? Uh, and that's really where the most significant lessons are. Uh, we moved our business uh, from Seattle, Washington in 2007 to Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the number one exposition and trade show city in the world. And I thought simply by having our trade show company in the in the biggest in, in the you know in the big, biggest city in the world in terms of that of that industry that that would be enough, um, and it wasn't. And we failed miserably and really almost got down to the brink of our extinction as a company. Um, but I wouldn't trade that strategy that that experience for anything in, in in the world because it really caused me to look at where the gaps were in the plan, and there were several. Um, and it's really those lessons that have been applied moving forward that have really contributed to the major success of the company in the last five years. You know, in my experience, um, all learning comes from failure. Whether it's you're taking a test and you miss a few answers and then you sit back and try and figure out why you missed them. Um, you know, I too have had a situation in my company where we were at the brink of failure. We had 95 employees in 2008 and the financial crisis hit really the global financial crisis that hit everywhere. Uh, and over six months, we dropped from almost 100 employees down to 30. And we lost like 60% of our top line revenue that came in from new sales. And, you know, there were so many things that we learned coming out of that that it really shaped and morphed who, what the company is today in terms of the investments in technology that we've made to make sure that we can continue to scale and we can do it with a labor cost that makes sense. Um, the way that we manage cash and our financials changed. Uh, you know, we had had many years of successful runs where we had been able to be lazy about how we managed our finances. And when the recession hit, we couldn't do that anymore. And it has dramatically changed um, where we're at as a company in terms of our financial stability and our ability to invest capital going forward. So. And I'll say this, the... Um I think one thing that kind of separates the entrepreneur is they typically have a high tolerance for failure. Um, they're taking on risks that many, many people are not comfortable taking on. Um, one thing I can say is I really value within my own company uh, when employees themselves and different team members are willing to take a shot at something. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that we want to foster in our, in our culture. One of our values is called is progress, which is we state it as fresh thinking is essential for progress and progress is essential. I want team members who feel comfortable taking some risks and knowing that if we fail, it's okay as so long as we learn from it. Now, granted, we have to be able to measure and, 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 and take calculated risks. We can't try something that's going to jeopardize the state of the whole company. But uh, so for those of you who, who may not ever own or run your own company, but you're going to be a team member, um, having some sort of comfort with failure so long as you're trying, I think is an important trait to have. And just inherently, if you are working on trying to solve a problem that no one else has solved in this particular way before, you're not always going to be right. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. It's statistically impossible. 
So the only way as an entrepreneur that you can deal with it is just to get comfortable with this idea that failure is not an end state. It's not like you're dead and you can no longer do anything else. It just means you didn't get it right that time. And if you have clarity around what the problem is that you're trying to solve, then you can say, hey, our hypothesis was that we were going to be able to solve the problem this way. It didn't work. So now what are we going to try that's different? And when that doesn't work, what are we going to try that's different? And you just keep iterating until you figure it out. Uh, in, our biggest, in our business, one of the biggest challenges we have is that our business is seasonal meaning there are a couple of months out of a 12 month year where we are just incredibly busy. And then 10 months out of the year where none of our clients wanna show up to get the work done. Well, from our client's perspective, they don't care that all the other customers are coming in those two months and want the work done. But we can't, because of the specialized nature of our business, we can't hire people for 12 months that only work for two months. And so we have been actively working on this problem of how can we get our customers to respond earlier? How can we get them to engage us at different times of the year? How can we get their information more accurately so we don't have to go back and forth as many times? Uh, this is a problem I haven't seen any company solve before. Uh, so I know that as we continue to work on this, we're gonna have many more failures than we have successes. That's okay. It doesn't change the fact that if we can figure out how to solve this problem, it will dynamically change our business. It will dynamically change the value and the experience for our customers. And that's why we're here, because our whole purpose of being in business is to help people go out there and successfully start other companies in the U.S. That is the impact that we measure our success by. So tying into that, um, the concept of, of failure and learning to grow with your own companies uh, and the culture aspect, um, and Sean, you touched on this briefly. So when you are hiring people for your company, you know, what are the key things you're looking for? And how has that changed over the last, from the beginning of the business to now? I don't know that I start off the interviews with it, but one question I ask in every interview is, tell me about a time in the last 12 months that you failed and what you learned from it. And what I'm looking for is, does someone have the self-awareness to understand that they have failed and the self-awareness to be able to say, I failed from that and here's my learning I take from it. You guys might be surprised how many people cannot recall a single thing that they failed at in the last 12 months. Those are not real people. At least I've never met someone that has never failed at anything in the last 12 months. Um, there are also lots of people who when I ask them this question, they'll tell me a story about this failure and then they'll tell me why it's everyone else's fault. Why it's their boss was a jerk or why it was they didn't have enough resources or why it was doesn't matter. For me, I'm just looking for, can they own it? Can they take responsibility for the fact that when they get outcomes that happen in their lives that they don't like, they can choose to either make that someone else's problem, which requires them to not change at all, or they can take responsibility and say, what can I change about how I'm interacting? What can I learn from this situation to step forward and have a better chance of getting the outcome I want the next time? Those are the kind of people who are going to succeed in our culture because those people are coachable, they want to learn and they want to grow. And if they want to do that, then we can add them to our business and they will help us grow. But the people who want to make it everyone else's fault, they just, they give me a headache. They make my heart hurt. Then I spend all my time having to deal with people issues instead of solving really great problems that are going to help our customers. We spend a lot more time interviewing and filtering for people to come into our company. When we first started, we would take anyone that didn't seem like a jerk when they came in. Like, if you can do the job and you're not a mean person, then yeah, we're gonna give you a job because we needed, we needed people to come in and do it. And over the years, what we found is we found that there were certain kinds of people who would succeed in our company and certain types of people who would fail. And so now we run, we make uh, every employee who comes through our, or every potential employee who comes through our system, we make them take a test that helps us understand what their behavioral wiring is. And we actually profile each of the roles in our company to that. Because if you, if you need someone, let's say in finance, who's really detail oriented, and you find somebody who you really like and is really gregarious and they're not good at details, they're gonna fail in that particular role. So we assess things that way. Uh, we assess it from a cultural standpoint. Um, what we found is that the cost of turnover for us on an average employee, uh, so an average employee in the U.S. for us probably makes $40,000. And the cost of turnover for someone in a role like that is about fifteen dollars to 20000 
it's a huge number. It's a huge amount of what you pay someone if you get that wrong. And I can't tell you that we never get it wrong, but we continue to refine our process so that we let fewer and fewer people into our system that aren't good fits. For us, I do a lot of our second interviews or a lot of our hiring managers do the first interviews. Um, I do not, I rarely, rarely ever look at a resume. Um, where they've worked in the past, um, what their degree, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you of our 65 employees at Steelhead who has a degree or what the degree is in. I don't even know. Um, so 24 hours in a day, a work, a work day in the United States is about eight to 10 hours. That's a third of your life. That is a, that's half of your awake hours. So I'm really looking for uh, temperament, uh, their characteristics. I mean, obviously you have to have the skill set, but I wanna hear them explain to me uh, in terms of a res resume, I'm a lot more interested in a verbal resume. Tell me about your last job. Tell me about some of the successes and failures that you've had. Um, how did you, uh, uh, you know, what sort of process improvement did you create at your last company? How did you go about doing that? How many people did you work with? Did you ever have any conflicts on your team? How did you resolve, resolve those? Um, the academic part um, is, essential and you know if you're gonna be a doctor in the United States you, you have to have gone through the right school so you know what an appendix is versus what a heart is um, but I find that our business is is much more interpersonal than that um, so I really want to try to get a sense of uh, are they a curious person um, do they are they interested in seeing how things work because if they are they can maybe diagnose uh, any sort of breakdown and whatnot so um, I'm really sitting across from a person and I'm trying to see if they're going to integrate well onto our team. Yeah. So I went to school originally to be a teacher and I didn't have a really great master plan. Uh, I didn't have anyone in my life who, as I was finishing high school, was counseling me on how to think about this long-term plan for my life. And so what I understood was I had gone to school for 12 years and I had a pretty good idea of how that worked and I thought I could do this well. What I found when I got into my student teaching, which in the US, when you get to your third year, you start actually working in classrooms with students, I found that I was having more fun in my job where I was managing a restaurant than I was at my student teaching. And I thought, wait a second, I'd never thought about this fact that maybe the thing that drew me to teaching was I like working with and coaching and developing people. And it turns out that's more exciting and interesting to do with people who are motivated and trying to grow in their career than a bunch of eighth grade students who don't want to listen to anything you have to say. Um, and so I told myself I was just going to take a break and go back to school. It just never happened, right? One thing took on another. I started traveling around the United States, opening up restaurants for this company I worked with. And then I got an opportunity to get into real estate. And so it was like all these dominoes happened in my life where uh, I just sort of fell into things until I found the one thing where I said, oh, that makes sense. And you know, I always tell young people when they ask, well, how should I think about planning for my life? I said, I don't know. But I get a lot of value when thinking about how venture capital works in the United States. So venture capital, is anyone familiar with venture capital? Like how in the United States there are wealthy individuals who then fund these startup companies. So things like Facebook and Uber and other things that you might recognize are all um, foundationally started by these types of investors. And their philosophy is they look for, to invest in 10 companies and they know that eight of those companies are gonna fail miserably. And that one of those companies is gonna be okay and then one of those companies is probably gonna be really, really great and that's how they work. And I think about when I was young Sometimes it's good to try a bunch of different things because in trying some stuff, you're going to find, I think, what things don't suit you, what you really like, and that'll give you more clarity on where you really want to make a difference in the world, what you really want to do. Is anybody here in the middle of their studies and they're kind of questioning if they're doing the right, if they're studying the right thing? Yeah, just, just two. <laughs> How many of you would never raise your hand even if you, you were? <laughs> I mean, I think that's the thing too. Is the is the you know is, is really experiencing different different things. I love, 
I love the totality of business. I love the marketing thing. I love inventory management and logistics and the idea that winning and, and being exceptional at any one of those or hopefully all of those things. Uh, so I've got like a, but I also kind of have attention deficit syndrome where I, I'm curious and then, it, then I get bored and I want to go over here and do something else. So business is a very suitable thing for me. I have a natural curiosity uh, and then uh, I love details. And so I think for me, if I were in one thing every day, I would just get bored. Um, so entrepreneurship is a natural fit for me. Um, and then of course, I ultimately just love being around people and leading people and collaborating and talking about ideas. And um, I just think it's fun. I mean, I don't really feel like I go to work, you know, sometimes I don't go to work. Um, take the day off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, again, my, my role in my company is really alignment. And, and the thing is, is our employees are working for money and they have a life. Um, and I, I want them to f be fulfilled with what it is that they're doing at Steelhead. And if they're not, then what I always say is it's not a prison. I mean, it's a volunteer system, right? And so uh, on the other hand, we have expectations. Um, and so uh, it's a matter of being really, really clear about where we are against the expectations. But it's not always, you know, kumbaya. It's not always easy. Can I tell a funny story? Yeah. So my favorite um, insane employee story is uh, we, so for our clients, we obviously have to get credit card information because we have to charge them for these things. And so one day we're in a sales meeting and uh, the receptionist comes in and she says, um, the, the city police are here to meet with you. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you guys, but when they say the police is here to meet for you, it's not exciting. So we walk out there and they said, do you have an employee named blank? Well, yeah, they're actually in the room there with us that we just came out of. And they're like, well, uh, they came in yesterday to a jewelry store with a credit card number written on a piece of paper and tried to buy a $20,000 diamond ring. At which point, we walked back into the sales room, asked everyone to leave except for that gentleman and said, guess what, today's your last day. Um, those things happen in business. And, you know, to Sean's point, you spend so much time at work that we've gotten much more deliberate over the years to make sure we're doing a good job of filtering out the kind of people who are going to make decisions like that and then moving on quickly when something does happen. So I was, I had an interesting situation. So I came on as a, as the first salesperson of a, of a business that had just started. It was about a year and a half old. Um, and I, uh, just after 9-11, our industry shrunk by about 45%. Um, and the company owed me some commissions, about $20,000 that they couldn't pay me. So I exchanged that for equity in the company. I said, that's fine, you don't need to pay me the commission, but I would want 15% of the company. And then two years later, I started to uh, run the company and then created the value to, that I needed to then buy the company. So I did not start Steelhead, but I took it over. And I don't know if I would have started it. I mean, I, really, I, I ask myself that all the time. Would I, like Jeremy said, if someone said, oh yeah, this is the plan, start it. I don't know that I would have. Um, but I had, even though my role was in sales, I was curious about the whole thing. And so quickly had my hands in all sorts of places and to, to where the owner says, well, you might want to just run this. Uh, so my story is a little bit different in that um, I did start the company and uh, I ended up getting into real estate after I um, was managing and opening restaurants. And I started to do that on my own, do some uh, real estate development and some investment. And I was working with a friend of mine on a couple of projects and we met with some attorneys uh, as part of that real estate project. And we were looking to raise some money from that project and they said, have you thought about using pension funds to fund this project. And we said, what are you talking about? You can't even do that. And they said, well, yes, you can. And so that's really what started our learning process. We ended up getting about two thirds of the funding for that project through uh, 
the equivalent of pension funds in the US. And from there, spun out the business ideas. We got more and more familiar with this. We saw an opportunity. We said, nobody knows that you can do this in the United States and nobody knows how to communicate it to consumers. So what if we could take this idea of taking this money that people have saved and helping them put this into something that is gonna perform for them, something that they may know, something that they can be active in like a small business uh, and help them move that forward. And so uh, that's how we ended up starting the company.